Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to our Halloween lecture, special edition um, coming up to so on this year. So we have um, Tyber Falset, who is a lecturer in Irish folklore and ethnology in the Celtic Studies program at UCD. Um, Tyber is Canadian originally, so it's nice to have that kind of link for someone who's Canadian with this uh, kind of historical interest in uh, the origins of folklore traditions in Ireland and Scotland in particular. Um, Tyber did his PhD in Scotland and he's now working in UCD as a lecturer in this area. Uh, Tyber, we're delighted to have you, so thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Sally. I'm delighted to be here and thank you for the invitation. Yeah. I just want to, um, I guess, start off with the real center of this which is that we love saying as the embassy of ireland and as irish people we love saying that halloween is originally irish it's uh, one of our claims to fame yeah. but i guess what are the actual origins of not only i guess halloween the word um but also the different names that halloween was called and where that comes from right yeah so i mean we're anyone living in the northern hemisphere right now on our planet is noticing the changing of the seasons, uh, you know, going into the darker time of the year, the nights are getting longer, and it's leaving this time for the harvest to be brought in, uh, the animals to be brought down from summer pasture back in, back into the, the, the field, so the family's reuniting, um, the hearth becomes a focal point to stay warm over the long winter nights, and of course in Ireland there's such a strong tradition of that hearth side as the uh, theater for the transmission and performance of uh, the the social world uh, identity, um, what 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 it means to be, you know, from a place. Uh, it's all rooted in that, and so we can see in these uh, really strong traditions um, that that have uh, existed on the island of Ireland and in its some of its neighboring islands. Um, a, a very interesting way in which. Um, the peoples that have lived in this in, in on, on in these places over time uh, have approached creating meaning out of and sent, making sense out of these transitions in the year. Um, you know, we can we can tie them into our own life cycle uh, where we see these repeated. Every trip around the sun shows us uh, another cycle of um, you know of growth and uh, and, and and fecundity and then harvesting and and uh, har and going to dearth and the darkness again and having those cycles repeated it, it allows this sort of um, very natural way for us as humans to sense with our in our groups and in, in our communities our own uh, mortality and so that's where a lot of these traditions are are born born out of that so um, I do have some slides set up on the uh, on some of the terminology that we have that that leads into this I might. Is, it, is now absolutely a good time to share, yeah throw share them the up. screen okay i put up i have my powerpoint together always for especially for all the virtual <laughs> lectures we've been doing over the last uh last year but uh so i i put it as a title here there's a lovely article in um sheen uh, which was a journal of for this postgraduate students uh in the folklore program uh, it's still running at, at university college dublin um and this is one um, from Padrigine Clancy, you did an amazing uh, description of Ike Hauna or Samhain's Eve on Inish Mode in the Air and Islands. And, a, and one of the phrases there that would be said is Shachan and Toish or mind, you know, watch out for the ghost, mind the ghost. So this, this idea of uh, um, the sort of things that we think are spooky and otherworldly about this time of year are really very much rooted to wider traditions around um, when, when we think about folk traditions in Catholicism, uh, all souls, all saints, um, the, the traditions of um, the, the ancestors who have passed on and they're, and, and they're commemorating them, remembering them at this time of year is all, all part of that as well. So we get some terms and you know, Kevin Danaher's um, volume, The Year in Ireland is, is, is that, that text to look at for, for uh, introducing yourself to the uh, incredible uh, wealth of calendar customs that we have in the Irish tradition. So uh, Ike Hauna means this Eve of Samhain. Um, and we can talk a little bit about what that word uh, comes from uh, in a moment, but you get other terminologies, Ike Nespritchina, the spirit night, Ike Nahamalesha, uh, the night for mischief and, and devilment. And so there's that idea of um, on top of this remembrance and the sort of making, uh, seeing the living semiotics of the 
of the life cycles in our natural world reflected in our own human life cycles and then making these uh, links to it, we have these release valves uh, that are that come at these points of the year at, at a threshold, a liminal point between two uh, two times, you know, going from the harvest into the winter, um, where there there are these opportunities for the sort of the carnivalesque, the celebratory to emerge and to have a social release that can lead to you know class, uh, you know, the idea of a, a, a trick. So Ikan and Gless is another one. Um, it's called Oiken Nanklesen in Scottish Gaelic uh, sometimes. Um, so we have all of these. And then, uh, you know, we know that fairies and um, otherworldly beings are, are um, out and about, uh, they, just like humans are doing their transhumans from the, the Bully or, or the Addy in, in Scotland down, or the Sheeling down to back into the infields, uh, bringing the livestock back. The, uh, fairies are doing their own flitting or transhumans from their summer um, areas of living into their winter dwellings as well. So we have this return to um, the, the the centers of our lives and all of this. And you get that strong tradition of the, the puka. And we've got some lovely examples. And I have to say before I forget that I'm very grateful to Johnny Dillon at the uh, National Folklore Collection at U UCD for giving us some wonderful sound recordings to share um, during our conversations. So I might, Sally, I know I'm talking a lot here, but um, I might jump ahead here and just say, you know, we have these four quarters um, in the year, the the Kahiraya, um, and those are sort of set between the solstices and the equinoxes as these uh, quarter days, these transitions. So um, the one that we're looking at here, Ikehauna is the eve of Samhain. Um, that is the beginning of the, it's a beginning and the end in so many ways. It's 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 uh, some 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 uh, commentators have likened it uh, cosmologically to um, a, a version of New Year, and we can see a lot of the New Year's traditions um, in the Hebrides and in other places um, are really tied very much tied to some of the the guising traditions that we we see um, in the in the international tradition of Halloween that sort of was born out of um, and evolved from you know probably diasporic. Uh, Im you know, immigrants bring some of these traditions uh, to other other parts of the world with them. Um, so we have that, and then the, the next uh, quarter would be Loyal Breach uh, or the Feast of St. Bridget on the 1st of February, which of course is very close to uh, Canada's and, and the States, uh, uh, other, other celebration of Groundhog Day and trying to prognosticate the, uh, the, the future weather. And so it's no, it'll be no surprise when we start to look at some of the traditions around uh, Ikehauna that at these quarter days, there's also that desire um, at these liminal points to be able to discover what lies ahead through divination, mm -hmm. through prognostication, um, and and especially if if the ancestors are you know uh, the, the the ancestral dead are returning uh, to be among um, their their living kindred, you you can see how this cosmologically would build into trying to divine what might happen in one's life. Um, that that is not yet known, and of course we have May Day on the first of May, and then Lunasa Lammas Day, uh, Garland Sunday on the first first of August. So um, you know we have these these divisions, and Henry Glassie is sort of uh, we can see in his diagram. There's a lovely uh, a lovely picture here uh, from his passing the time in Ballymanone uh, on the on the community of Fermanagh. But you can see quite well here, you know, how these are right in between a lot of our the, the solstices and the equinoxes. We have these quarter days um, as thresholds between these times where so much uh, in terms of the folklore and folk ways uh, emerges in, its, in, in, the, in the symbolism of what's, what's practiced at these times. It's also, I guess, it becomes a, a time of release as well. You know, you're Absolutely. going through a, a certain tangible part of the year that suddenly turns into this. What's the next quarter going to look like? How do we, I guess, go forward from that? And and what's what's to come? So I guess there's this point where you're taking a break. It's a bit of a reset. And you do have these very traditional festivals then around that, this kind of, like you said, a, a celebration, but also these different traditions at those times. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's that's exactly it, Sally. Um, and we we can think about especially the one the period that we're entering, if we're looking at it in the context of the, you know, the agricultural year and um, the, you know, the, the, the need to ensure that we can survive through a long winter. There's all that focused energy 
on the success of the agricultural uh, growing season and at harvest then there's this there's this time to look back to pay debts to consider what's to come next and there's the, the, the there's time for things that there wouldn't have been time for uh, in the summer you know it's it's storytelling season we have the you know the proverb scale oh how and gebeltena story from Samhain to Beltane to May Day. And that's that tradition of uh, out on the evening nights, the storyteller uh, would, would, would be gathering folk around the hearth and, um, and entertaining, you know, in the days before Netflix and streaming services, <laughs> this was the uh, gathering point. So, and in listening to folk tales that might be about extraordinary things, you know, and uh, you know, the, the, there's the release in that as well. Um, and we can think about the symbolism of, of, of those in, in, the, in the ways in which we reflect on our own, um, our own life and our own life cycle. So that's, that's all a big part of it. And, um, oh, what was that? Yeah, the, so the etym um, etymologies that we have, there, there's no, we don't have a, an exact etymology for uh, Samhain and, uh, you know, that gives us Ike Hauna, the Eve of Samhain. Um, Michael Clary in his 17th century glossary uh, equated to Fuin and Taurion, the end or death of the summer. Um, so we, we think that might be tied to uh, some, some traditions, you know, of uh, uh, reconstructed uh, proto-Celtic and proto-Indo-European roots, but are tied to the, these um, oppositions of Saurag and Gyaurag, or Saura and Gyaura that we get in the Gaelic languages. And we see that reflected in the Gaulish continental long, long uh, since extinct calendar uh, 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 representing um, the, the, the um, Samonios and Giamonios that you get in, in the Gaulish calendar. But there's another neat um, one that's put, put forward that's been, that was put forward um, on, by Whitley Stokes, um, thinking that it had something to do with um, an idea of an assembly or a swarm at this time. So that idea of the release and then also get, gathering together mm -hmm. um, is a big part of this and we know um you know the the sort of the traditions around that really uh we can look at um your know, recent archaeological digs that have been done uh in county meath at the at Tlothta, uh, Tlothta or the the hill of ward where recently that you know in 2014 they were seeing uh repeated very large uh evidence for 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 large bonfires uh you know in the iron age there around 500 ce so we have that, and then also in 2019, just to talk about what we what we think about in, in tradition. And I, I have to thank Johnny for bringing this up in a lovely lecture that he gave at the um, uh, Irish Embassy in, in uh, Warsaw uh, a few years ago. Um, that the Dublin Fire Brigade has done an amazing map to show the uh, incidents of, of of bonfires in our in contemporary Ireland in, in the city of Dublin in 2019. So we can see these living traditions uh, at play, and that's that's so much of what we're looking at in folklore is the dynamism of tradition and and uh, how you know things that are seen in the long distant uh, archaeological record and past are um, evolve and transform and and re and emerge and reemerge in, in in interesting ways uh, that we can sort of say oh well there's there's something there's something to that so that's sort of when we're looking at halloween we're always grasping at these similarities and then um and then they transform themselves in our you know popular contemporary discourse as well um, but those are all all sort of interesting things to, to think about um, there is something yeah. about, I guess, Halloween in particular as a holiday, as an event that feels more primal in a way or more traditional than I think a lot of other Halloweens, like other holidays. Like when you think about the traditions of bonfires, it's a very early human thing to gather around that. But when you think about some of the other traditions as well, I think some of them have changed quite a bit, but some of them haven't. So I guess yeah. one of them is, is pumpkin carving, which is so popular today, <laughs> but has these historical roots in, in turnip carving. So I guess what, what are some of the traditions that got lost along the way or that maybe got transformed beyond belief for some of these kind of early things at that time of year? Yeah, like so the things that folks would do at Halloween that maybe aren't done as much today. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I mean, I was giving my life cycle lecture early in the day and I... Uh, we were talking. Uh, we were talking about divination practices around courtship and looking at the examples from Halloween. So um, there, there were so many um, that you know, so the students were like, "Oh, I didn't know about these." So lots of those traditions aren't remembered. But um, we can see, uh, you know, I was looking at some of the. Um, I was because because we're you know we're visiting virtually Ottawa today. I went to the old the old um, uh, newspaper. Uh, the I'm going to try to click here if it takes me. 
Oh, there we go. Yeah, I went to the Ottawa Citizen and there was a whole, the 29th of Oct October in 1928, there was a whole list of the sorts of games, divinatory games that would be played um, that are being called uh, in that, that, uh, that term uh, Celtic, uh, but tied to, you know, uh, of course, peoples coming over, immigrants from Scotland, from Ireland, from Wales. Uh, you get a list of, of those traditions, um, like um, uh, taking two uh, hazelnuts and putting them on the grates of a fire and, uh, and naming them after two people. And if they jump off together, that means that uh, they might get married or um, putting uh, uh, the, you know, breaking an egg and, and, and watching the whites in, into a, a glass of water and watching what the egg whites do. And if they branch you know, into two trees, it said, oh, well, that's you know, the sign of a, a, a pairing, or if it stays at the bottom, that might not be such a good sign. Uh, you, you get all, all sorts of things. Um, uh, I, I've got, I sort of got a, I, I don't know if um, we want to jump into some of the uh, examples there, but that, that might be. Yeah, might be, let's jump in. Those. That sounds great. So, I mean, I, the one thing I, so I wanted to show these newspaper uh, headings just where we have the idea of the fairies being about and the transhumans there. And I've got these, I, I want to share some of these recordings that um, were prepared from the National Folklore Collection. Um, this one uh, was collected by Seamus McPhillip uh, from Peter Tierney in uh, Knockmitten in County Dublin. Um, and we have a description of lift, there, there's sort of, um, in, in the old, when we look at the vernacular architecture in Ireland, there's uh, sometimes the descriptions of certain areas in the house that were um, set aside for only special occasions that wouldn't be part of the everyday um, inhabitation of the of the house and the idea of the west room and on this and on the west side of the house quite often it was uh it was always avoided to build anything on that side of the house in terms of outbuildings because it, it was um we could talk about you know adult sheer going west as as the passing on or uh going going um going on to the next uh stage of life um we we see that that side of the house is often uh associated with otherworldly uh, perambulation as well. So in this, we'll, we'll just listen to Peter here talking about um, ab about a, a pig um, a, a pig pen that was lifted uh, that was built at that at, at the at a particular site that uh, needed to be retrofitted uh, to accommodate the the fairies' movements. And uh, was it supposed to be unlucky to, to interfere with where they lived? Was it? They couldn't go next to theirs. Because my mother's mother, my father's mother built a piece to it here, the back of that wall, there, mm. there. And we used to have a couple of sours, pigging. As he me, I said, George built the pig story there, at the back of that wall. And boy, the fairies goes boy that way. Uh, it's only once a year, though. How was that? What, t what time is that? What time of the year? So, when does the fairies come? <laughs> it's a Hall Halloween. Hall Halloween. Or Halloween time. And we had to build a, open a, a little, she was a path. Wherever they go, no one ever knew. Of <laughs> course, they were gone now forever. And remember the man that built it? He left a little. I put it away in there, out there. Just out here. I let them go through into knock mitten. Yep. So we have that, uh, you know, sort of the don't don't build things on that part of the the house because the fairies will be passing at Ichihauna. Uh So these you know these beliefs, and we might uh, we might talk about you know this. And it's it, it's a, these cosmologies are rooted in in folk belief systems that are integrated with uh, you know both institutional uh, knowledge and and. Uh, and tradition, uh, we can think about, uh, you know, the ideas of um, of of, of uh, the, you know the remembrance and all souls um, and, and all saints uh, going in uh, and with intentions for uh, family members uh, when when there was still the po the the strong belief in purgatory, um, and then we have the idea of the gathering sites for um, these fires being sometimes burial mounds themselves of the long distant ancestral dead. So all this is. Is tying together into that fairy belief system, and sometimes, you know, when we talk about these things in um, sort of discrete uh, contemporary discourse. We we separate them out from one another, but really, what we have is a you know a real intersection of of belief systems that overlay and interact with one another, both official and in the vernacular folk domain as well, that are are part of one another. 
Um, and those belief systems were were used to explain something that was actually real or actually happening in a way that might have been understand like hard to understand at the time so I think a lot of the times when you hear about these superstitions around the fairies what it actually was was things to do with like the the weather or the crops in a way to mitigate well, exactly. perhaps negative factors but it's really interesting that we have I guess this this heightened superstition around Halloween again you know because this time where it was really important for the harvest suddenly there was a, there's a risk of, of messing with the fairies or that's it yeah and yeah. risking risking the next cycle not being you know bringing bad luck to it and we can think about you know every all of the intentions you know we have when we talk about you know folklorists we try to avoid the term superstition sometimes because it brings although there is the you know the, of course you know the people that we talk to uh the folk themselves use the term uh to, to try to uh make sense of it sometimes but uh, other times there's you know it's, it's a bit more sensitive the, that these belief systems are sort of, they're very rooted and they are, you know, very much believed in by those uh, that, that, that express and, uh, and participate in, in the uh, folkways around them. Um, but, but one interesting thing to think is that we have um, both experience and then the cultural knowledge that's transformed to us influencing our worldview. So just as you were saying, you know, if there was a really good year and everything was done, you know, as it was told to you by your grandparents and everything went just right, you would start to, you know, build these cultural layers of uh, adhering to those um, beliefs and actions and folkways that would be maintained across generations to, uh, and, and, and you would avoid other behaviors, you would avoid um, prohibitions uh in the same way to try to um to to maintain good luck uh and to avoid to avoid bad luck so this is this is all at play especially when you're living a subsistence uh lifestyle that's rooted in the agricultural year um that's that's where we're getting this this um build up of anxiety and the releases and the uh the time to look on our own mortality as as living, you know, as living beings in, in a in a natural that's reflected in the natural world around us in these annual cycles, it all it all comes together, uh, it, you know, in, the, in these in these rather organic ways over time and space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know. I maybe went a little off there, Sally. No, that was great, honestly. Okay. Okay. Um, I think you have a few more audio clips, don't you? Oh, abso absolutely. Yeah, and I've got another one on the puka. Yeah, um, which is very exactly. unique to that. That's that's very much unique to um, Irish tradition. There's been a lot of research on it, um, but this was another. When we talk about you know cultural, um, I'm sorry, I might have uh, frozen there for a moment. Sally, can you still hear me? Yes, can still hear you. Okay, well I'm back again. Okay, great. When we talk about these cultural um, influences on folk belief and the things we do, um, the, the puka is a good example of that. Uh, we talk about after Ikehauna, there's that a widespread belief that it should be avoided um, to pick and eat berries after this after this time. And one of the reasons given is that the puka has defecated on them. And the puka, we you know, how do we envision it? It's sometimes you know, sort of an equine uh, like a donkey or a or a, a horse or a goat or all these different uh, sorts of um, of images. And there's a lovely um, a lovely episode of the Blodany Bailichish. Um, podcasts on the puka recently and looking at some of the the contemporary uh traditions around that but we have these uh traditions as a way of maybe protecting uh children from getting fermented berries or berries that might make the mill uh and mm -hmm. a way of sort of warning them of the dangers and it's this tension between our culture world and the natural world at play there so we have the world of it of the you know ancestral dead we have the world of of the wilderness and then we have the uh, this this gathering around the hearth side and the remembrance of uh, knowledge that has been transmis transmitted over generations for the continued um, survival of the of the group of the folk group of the community. So we have a neat one here about uh, uh, talking about the berry tradition of the not picking the slows at this time and getting pegged off. How to get off the puka if you end up uh, g getting getting stuck in the markiacht and fuka. You don't want to be uh, you don't want to be stuck on the puka. But sometimes the puka protects, and it's that sort of you have this. Uh, you know, in a lot of these other worldly traditions, you have this um, navigation of protection um, and danger, uh, both at play, and you're never quite sure, uh, you know, that sometimes are they are they benevolent? 
are they malevolent or are they ambivalent you know these otherworldly forces so we see that very much in the in the traditions surrounding the puka and so um here we have and i'll just um this is this is from patrick uh, johnson uh from uh, Cal- uh moat in westmeath he, he was a farmer um at the age of 82 uh recorded in uh on the 6th of november just after uh Ike Hauna in 1964 and again from the national folklore collection so we'll we'll play it here oh what does the puka do the puka is supposed anyone that wants to is to pull them before that night yeah that if they didn't pull them before that night he's supposed to shake now the slows and no they can't be used you understand now yeah so they were supposed to be a puka. Everyone was saying, what's a puka? Yeah. And what class is he? Did anyone ever see him? Is he in the shape of a dog or what? No. These old people said he's in the shape of an ass, a black ass. Donkey. But now there's no puka this many a year. And what happened to him? Well, I'll tell you what happened to him. This fella, he, the poker will come behind you and he run his head right in under your two legs and he hates you back at him. And away he start. And he tear you through bushes and he tear you through the ditches and you get all told of him and he clean you up when he think you had enough of it. But this fella at Tanneret, he was up on his back and he had a good sup of drinking and he come to this ditch and the puka tore out as the puka he was like in the shape of a black ass but he tore out through the ditch and he got out and he got such a tear and he said it was a word that was used put in a gyro <laughs> and give him a prod if your left hand or your, your thumb on the side and he said put in a gyro and he was pegged off of the puka. Well, then everyone had it, and the puka hadn't one bit of use in getting under your legs because you showed out Spujini. Oh, Spujini Giro, yeah. And when he take that, the uh, he'd, he'd go off and just fling you off right away. Sorry there, uh, <laughs> Sally. Uh, so we, I, I, I cut off. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for cutting off the recording. Don't there. worry. That was great. Um, but it's it's yeah, it's really neat. And we think about these idea. I mean, there's a strong tradition in um, uh, in in Gaelic uh, cosmology, both in Gaelic Ireland, Scotland, and up, up until contemporary contemporary times of the fear of abduction by otherworldly hosts, uh, beings like the puka, like the fairy uh, Slua, the Slua she. Um, and and you know when I was uh, when I was um, teaching back on Prince Edward Island, uh, some of my students were from. Uh, St. Peter's, which was an area uh, settled by um, uh, by immigrants from the Southern Outer Hebrides, and they still had traditions of uh, in English about the sluag that would lift people and take them away. And so these perambulations at this time, so you have the um, the spirits of uh, the dead, the fairies, the puka, all uh, as part of this. And so it's quite natural to think about the guising traditions that come out of that as well, and the disguises to sort of mask oneself. Uh, and, and and create these um, points of blurring between the human cultured world and the other world. And as we, you know, we in some of the earlier traditions, there's there's those descriptions that nothing could be hidden. And, you know, we have these repetitions of phrases like the veil is thinner at these times of year, but this, this um, you know, that the fairy mounds are open, um, the, the mounds that contain ancestral dead, these otherworldly spirits are are part of part of that as well. And so the idea of perambulating and visiting at night it's very much part of that um, that tradition. Um, oh, what was I doing here? I I wanted yeah the idea of mischief. We had Icha Nahamalisha in Irish there for sort of the night of divilment. Um, and I, I guess to, where trick or treat comes from. This trick or treat idea of the tricks. So <laughs> I wanted to start on the trick aspect here, and I thought it'd be really a nice opportunity to talk about a newspaper that we we have uh, from Canada. Uh, from the Scottish Gaelic speaking diaspora um, that was published in Sydney, Cape Breton from um, from 1892 to 1904, Mahtala or meaning echo. Um, and this was the longest running newspaper in uh, Scottish Gaelic, in the Scottish Gaelic language ever, uh, you know, including up to the present day. And you had subscribers all over the world, but there's some really neat uh, 
bits of news that were given at the time. And its edit editor, Jonathan G. McKinnon, was uh, himself um, a, a very uh, important collector and documenter for Scottish Gaelic tradition in the maritime uh, Gael talk of uh, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and of course, uh, the, 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 the island, uh, uh, Cape Breton Island off the mainland coast of uh, Nova Scotia. So we have these descriptions um, that we get. Uh, um, this past Monday, uh, uh, and the lads in every place were on their feet late into the evening to play tricks. They usually play on that merry night. Oichihauna only comes but once a year, and we can't blame them for making a bit of fun for themselves as long as they keep from causing other folks harm. Although every gate won't be in its proper place, so we have this idea of the removal of gates and so when we talk about these uh, and we have, we have a lovely recording um as well of, of this tradition in the irish context of taking gates or steps as these um sort of thresholds and that's part of the confusion of it's sort of like a masking but in a in a spatial sense of the of the landscape of the housecape of the of the living um the, the dwelling and the and the infields is to take gates and replace one person's gates with another. Um, and that's that's part of this tradition of sort of blurring lines between one homestead and another uh, at, at this time and doors would be left open. So um, it won't do us any good to be crotchety and, and judgmental about these traditions. Instead, we, we should keep it up as a thing that should not be shunned. Um, and I might I might jump ahead here. Yeah, um, to, to that's just that's a very Irish sort of Scottish attitude, I think, as well. Like, <laughs> ah, sure, if they're not doing anyone any harm, why about the front? <laughs> that's it. And I mean, I've got it. So it's interesting to see every year of the newspaper going on. If we go to 1899, uh, the judgment comes in a little bit more there. Tuesday <laughs> night was Oike Hauna. There was not nearly the same amount of damage done by the lads throughout the town as there used to be in previous years. There are more constables. So we have this description of law enforcement coming in to prevent <laughs> things from happening here now to keep an eye on, on the young folk. But throughout the countryside, um, you know, out, out in the rural uh, farmsteads of, of, of Gaelic speaking Cape Breton, there's no doubt that there weren't just as many cabbages and turnips stolen as ever were in years past. So we, and that idea of the cabbage stealing as well uh, would be part of the divination ceremony where you would, you lift up a, you'd be blindfolded going out into the kale yard of a neighbor and you'd uh, pick up a cabbage and, and depending on how it looked, you would say, oh, well, this is, this looks like who I might marry. And they would say, oh, there's a lot of soil on the roots. That means the person will be quite wealthy. Well, there's not, there's not so much soil. They might not have as much in terms of material wealth. Oh, it's slender. It's, it's round. It's uh, so like sort of trying. And then sometimes naming the cabbage uh, uh, after a person. And if they, uh, if they entered the house, uh, as, as, as part of the number that of the person that entered, they would, they would sort of prognosticate if, if the match would happen or not out of, out of those sorts of games that would be played. Something we um, should bring back. Maybe, yeah. I'm, and maybe growing our own kale rather than stealing our neighbors. But yeah. we know, we know <laughs> kale is good for us, so it might not be a bad thing. Uh, get, have a nice kale salad on on the first of November <laughs> after after uh, the divination of, of the thirty yeah. first. Um, so we we have these uh, traditions throughout Ireland of of the of the you know of going out um, and uh, and guising, you know, putting on disguise. And and visiting and um, one of the you know I was mentioning the one uh, from Inishmoor in the Aran Islands. Um, there's I just wanted this this quote about the gates. What we were talking about earlier about these like thresholds. Um, we have this this lovely description from uh, Padraig and Clancy in her article in Sheenshire. Um, and I really recommend going to RTE's archive exhibit on Halloween. There's great clips there, and there's one of the uh, the Aran Islands uh, celebration of Ikehauna. But the way. Um, Clancy puts this tradition uh, is, is I, I just wanted to quote here for a moment. Um, Coming to the door of a house, a taish anticipates no barriers, so that this is the, the spirit or ghost to his or her entry, expecting the door to be open. Traditionally, locks are not to be put on the doors of the house on this eve on Aaron. Most doors are left on the latch or slightly ajar. Some are even left wide open. This is done not so much to welcome the Taisha to the homestead as to let him or her in. The entrance of the house, the doorway marking the normal boundary between the inner world of the insular family and the outside world of the community that and into the and you can look at the sort of circles of you know the, the farm, the, the agricultural land, and then outward into um, grazing pastures and then outward into non 
uh, wild places that are not part of the, they're part of that, they're, they're supernatural in that sense where, where a lot of these uh, encounters happen are all, are all going back to that central hearth. Um, so the normal boundary between the inner world of the family and outside world is temporarily abandoned as the other world in the form of the Taish is permitted to enter the house freely and uninhibited. So we, we have this as a, a big part of that tradition and it's rooted in the night visiting traditions, the rambling houses, the Kaylee houses that we have. And we can, you know, we can see all the different words, you know, Arnul and Bahuntiocht, uh, Kortiocht, uh, Kaylee, all being terms for the, 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 the types of gatherings in which so much of the kinds of uh, folk knowledge and expression would be transmitted um, in, in the community. So, you know, the reason we have amazing long folk tales in our, uh, in the National Folklore Collections archives, you know, collected as part of the Irish Folklore Commission's work is because of these, uh, these institutions, these informal vernacular institutions for the transmission of knowledge that you get long tales, long stories, the maintenance of beliefs are very tied into this visiting. And it's also, um, you know, tying into the ideas of, um, the, the, the courtship that would happen at this time would be some of the first instances in which young people might meet someone else from outside their family. Um, and, and it was that this was the start of that visiting season of the night visiting season. Uh, so much, so much a part of that. Sorry, I'll, I, yeah, I'm those, talking too much here. <laughs> no, not at all. I like this is this is all you. But in terms of the spirits, were they typically seen as benevolent or were was there sometimes a spirit that was a little bit more malevolent what was the kind of folklore in that i i think there was you get a sense in in uh, the descriptions from uh from Inish Mohr of it of of the um there being a bit of anxiety about this that this wasn't something that was sort of uh and i don't know if benevolent or malevolent is the right word but there it it, it probably ties into these um these our own anxieties of our own mortality and uh, the uncertainty around what happens in the next life, and it builds it builds up uh, in certain ways that maybe aren't so much the you know the scary or horrific ways that we think or uh, or the monstrous ways we think about in um, our contemporary discourse, but are are rooted in our own ways of trying to make sense out of our own fallibility as as humans. Um, and where did the idea of the guises come from where does that idea of dressing up because now we dress up as everything but was there traditionally I guess a set of characters that people dressed up as or was it just a spirit or where does that kind of come from in our history yeah well guising is done you know in so many cultures throughout throughout the world um it, you know so it's a way of um taking on another um identity of of uh this is part of those releases that are tied to uh some of the mischief and tricks as well that we can release and be someone outside ourselves for a moment and blur the lines between um the supernatural other world and our own uh you know human um uh, mortal uh, fallibility so that that's all at play um as well but the threshold again looms large in the guising traditions of you know we we, we, I grew up with a rhyme and, you know, in North America, of like trick or treat, trick or treat, give us something good to eat. And if you don't, uh, love, and it goes on like that. But the, the idea of reciting um, a rhyme for entry into the house um, is something we see repeated in um, the New Year's customs. So a lot of, uh, we were looking at the Hebridean uh, and, and uh, Cape Breton Gaelic traditions around Oichia, um, Oichia Kalwin or the, uh, or New Year's Eve, um, you'd have groups of, of uh, children going from house to house with a rhyme that they had to recite to gain entry into the um, into the house and to receive you know cookies and cake and and uh, tea and milk and 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 you know treats uh, in that sense. So we we have you know when we think about going back to that proverb scale lo how and gebelt as this tradition around uh, the storytelling season, we can see the idea of visiting and giving the gift of verbal art. Of, of something that you know entertains and carries people into uh, a sense of unity and connection with one another at the heart side um, that is uh, exchanged for um, a gift of food and uh, and hospitality and a lot of that is at play there in in the sort of the guising tradition and it's a, it's about uh, you know there's sort of an equalization that happens there um, when we talk about like the carnivalesque aspects of it where you have all these very rigid um, social hierarchical 
conditions that every individual is in in the, in the, in the community as part of daily life. But at these liminal uh, threshold times of year, there's an opportunity, you know, in, to, for the carnivalesque to emerge where you have the king becoming the fool and the fool becoming the king and the, 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 the sort of upheaval of the ordinary and everyday to allow for um, what you know, anthropologists like Victor Turner have called communitas of this, of this sort of equalization in a, in a special moment uh, and suspension of the hierarchy. And so the masking also facilitate the guising facilitated that as well. And I guess where, because this Halloween so far in our conversation has sounded overwhelmingly positive. <laughs> it's it's sounding like a very nice holiday with, I guess, these kind of, it is that getting together, that kind of figuring out how the next year is going to go. So was there like a tipping point where it starts to become scary or what we know is scary? Or is that the introduction yeah. of spirits? Does that kind of converge with um you know, the influence of religion, or was that just, I guess, a gradual sort of modernization of what Halloween was? Well, I mean, it could be the ways in which you know, we could see when we were looking at those Maktawa uh, sort of news items in the, in the Gallic newspaper from Cape Breton Island of, you know, starting out uh, over time and then getting a bit more, uh, you, you could sense a built up, uh, a build up of anxiety from the institutions, you know, of law enforcement, government, the church, etc., that we see these tensions emerge. And that is where a lot of those traditions might be imbued with, um, you know, by more powerful official, so, um, you know, institutional powers uh, might 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 bring degrees of judgment where a folk belief can turn into a superstition, where something that was uh, used as a as a natural way to release and to create an equilibrium for the community to go on um, and 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 to perpetuate. Uh, and be resilient in the future um, that we can see some of those uh, aspects as of, of play at play as well. Um, the same thing, you know, if we look at some of the, yeah, the other interesting thing is a lot of the um, Halloween traditions tie into the wake house traditions in Ireland and Sean O'Sullivan's book on that is, is, is uh, you know, on, on the Irish wake amusements. Um, a lot of those games that he lists in there are ones that would also be played on Ikehauna, and we can think of, you know, this idea of Ikehauna as a wake for the year that's about to end, and all of these intersections. So you have, have again that um, the the the, um, the two merging, and the clergy were really uh, they had. Sean O'Sullivan has some uh, amazing descriptions of just the the institutional um, official uh, cultures of a, of of a church or of of um, you know a, a local uh, law enforcement meeting. The idea of of the um, the community and this in this sense of the vernacular community and then having influence upon the ways in which um, popular discourse frames these um, these folk ways or these or these uh, these um, uh, beliefs folk beliefs. I guess as well like spirits traditionally weren't necessarily something to be scared of and I think the the further we've gone I guess throughout history the more I think humankind we've stepped away from from reckoning with our own mortality in a way that our ancestors kind of did every day and at these points so i guess just by the nature of it as well as the idea of spirits and ghosts got more scary to us that reckoning with our own mortality halloween is a you know all hallows eve becomes yeah. more tense more frightening uh, absolutely absolutely yeah and and sort of the breaking down of sort of the the, the gathering at the hearth side um, and the remembrance of, you know, so if, if a story is recited that was heard from a, uh, a neighbor who was an elder in the community and is recited long after that person passes in those moments of performance, you see the bring uh, back to life of this, this sort of the stream of the carrying stream of identity and knowledge um, that are rooted in the net, the social networks of the wider community um, that are these gifts that are passed on and reenacted and then passed on to the next generation uh, as, as part of as, as part of the communal identity. You've that, talked a little cool. bit about um, how this is translated in Canada, but are there traditions modern uh, in sort of modern times that are practiced in Canada and in Ireland and Scotland that come from these times or ones that have kind of transformed? Oh, I, sure, yeah, absolutely there are. I mean, the, the fieldwork done by, uh, by Dr. John Shaw, who was my doctoral supervisor at the University of Edinburgh in Cape Breton in the late 70s and early 80s there, um, was uh, remarkable in documenting traditions that were still very much alive. And now that there's um, active um, 
support from the Nova Scotia provincial government towards the renewal um, of the of the Gaelic language in the province through sort of um, master and apprentice programs of community language renewal, um, where you have first language elders in the community transmitting their their um, cultural knowledge and their linguistic knowledge on to younger people um, that you see these these traditions emerging the first Gaelic primary school was just opened outside of Scotland in in Mabu Cape Breton um, just this this uh, school year this this autumn and there are young children there that are um, you know actively engaging in some of the traditions that are tied to uh, maybe some of these more uh, the, these you know the idea of visiting the idea of uh, sharing a rhyme or a song or a story as part of the visit the exchange of hospitality the remembrance of uh, of those no longer with us um, the telling of you know uh, supernatural tales and beliefs are all being you know brought brought forward in that way uh, yeah I don't know does that answer <laughs> that sort of so Sally or is it no, that was completely it. I was more thinking of um, like Brack is still around. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, sorry, I went off. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's a, let's get tangible here. I'm, I'm being too intangible. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, we, you sent that amazing photo of your mom's Brack there, uh, Sally. I just put it up on the slide. I did. Uh, this, this is part of that. I mean, this is one of those, those really uh, uh, important traditions that we have in the, the Barin Brack or the Barn Brack. Um, where things would be placed in the uh, in 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 the brack uh, to sort of that would be d divided up and shared, and we have that lovely description in uh, in uh, James Joyce's uh, the story Clay and his in his um, the Dubliners, um, and we um, so we we have a ring for that if 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 somebody got the ring in their slice it would mean marriage a coin would mean uh, having having lots of money and wealth in the future a button would mean being a bachelor a thimble would mean being a spinster a chip of wood would be um, the idea of uh, having an abusive relationship a rag for poverty a bean or pea could equal wealth or poverty um, and a religious medal or an object of a religious object could mean ordination. Um, and this could also be done with champ or called canon as well. And in, yeah, and in Nova Scotia, one of the biggest traditions, in that, why am I, yeah, why, how have I forgotten this? Because uh, <laughs> what, we what we would do when I was a student at St. FX visiting, but uh, with other folks was the ma making um, tuarak, which is a little cold thing, but it's, it's a dish of whipped cream with um, toasted oats and sugar in it. Um, in which you'd have similar objects placed and people would be eating it uh, communally out of a big bowl with a spoon and whoever got um, you know the coin or or the you know etc the ring um, it would be divine it would be you know helping as a, as a game to prognosticate the future and I I put a link there's a lovely anyone that can um, that wants to go online after there's a I'll just try to put this here. There's a really nice uh, website that was done by the Nova Scotia uh, Highland Village Museum, Bell and Gale, um, that uh, is part of the Provincial Museums of Nova Scotia. Uh, there's a website called Entrochich, um, the bridge. Um, and it's, uh, there, you can actually see, um, uh, I think it's Shay McMullen, a friend of mine making fuarak for a, a group of Gaelic learners in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and you can get the recipe um, there by watching that. Yeah, <laughs> sorry sounds, for forgetting that bit there. No, it sounds delicious. I was just going to say I had to send a photo of my mom's because so far I haven't made a brack successfully myself. But. Yeah, that does, it does look delicious. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, and, I, and you were telling me it's hard, it's hard to get right. Yeah, uh, I'm sure, just for me. <laughs> yeah, ma, but but all, the mom always has the right touch, you know, as, as it is, you know, it's hard to replicate. It's the, very the true. Yeah. Have I missed anything obvious in terms of the, I guess, the the history or asking you um, about folklore? Is there anything that you think we should go into? Uh, I, I mean, I've, I've probably been talking everyone's ears off here for, for a good 45 minutes. So I, um, I'm, I'm always happy, you know, if anyone would like to get in touch and uh, ask questions. I, I, I as, as you know, Sally, I prepared more than we had time for to go through today, but I'm happy to share some links to things for people to continue their explorations around these traditions. And it's just, it's interesting to see, you know, the relationship between um, the traditions we see in Ireland, um, the, the neighboring traditions in, in Scotland, um, and, and we could go beyond, in, in, you know, in other, uh, in other contexts as well, but that, you know, all these traditions that we sort of put into, it's, it's sort of similar to what we were saying about, um, you know, trying to see, well, what's the malevolent or benevolent part, but we, we see links um, in these ways in which cultural uh, sense is made out of um, the, the patterns in our own lives, um, that, that there are links far beyond 
um, uh, what we what we readily. So you know, like I think the question at the beginning was looking for the origins of Halloween, um, and I think a better question is to look at the interrelationships of how we as humans have uh, have, have uh, the answer is in that in, in how we have uh, found similar ways of approaching um, our our being uh, with others in time and space. Um, as as is as evident in, in the traditions around Ika, Ika Hauna or Halloween. I think that's a lovely way of putting it. And I think Halloween in general, you know, as you say, it starts off as a way to mark a point in the year, a way to kind of reset, to look forward, to see what's going to happen. But I think then you do have these wonderful traditions and ideas that come out of it around folklore and mystery um, and I think there's a, in 32 words for field you know that recent book Lovely. there's this idea that um that the Irish language in particular goes back to a time when you know these sort of spirits and folklore and this connection with the natural world was much bigger and I think sometimes when you hear the kind of language around it and these traditions it does take you back but it's nice that so many of them are still around today and we can still connect with it in a way that maybe isn't there for all holidays or all the times of year that we celebrate. Well exactly and I mean we're, and we're talking about and sharing these you know on, on, on digital uh, through digital format, I mean, being able to be in different parts of the world and talking about, uh, you know, the, these sorts of folk beliefs is, is a really remarkable thing. We can talk about a, a you know, a digital sense of duchess of that sort of, uh, you know, intergenerational belonging to time and space. But we also have that in our digital landscapes now as well, um, when we see all the amazing sharing of, of uh, remembrance and, and knowledge about folkways on on social media. So this was this was a wonderful. I want to thank you again for. For, um, no, I want to thank you, <laughs> and also having too much <laughs> having too much left over is always a great thing because it means we can have That's you it. back and do something else. So. <laughs> That'd be wonderful. I would love that. Yeah, it's um, great, great to connect. You know, uh, across the sea um, uh, with with folks back home, and I'm very grateful for all the work the Irish Embassy does to connect um, you know, the nation of Ireland to to uh, Canada. It's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for this, Tiber. It's been fantastic. And it's been oh, such an interesting welcome. learning experience for me as well. Um, and happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. <laughs> yeah, Ika Hauna Hauna. Good